Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. I am Trace, and this is episode one of three of a very special episode that we have this week about bad science. You, got, you haven't heard of bad science? It's our new podcast that Seeker launched with our friends down in Los Angeles. Now, I know this sounds weird that we're going to talk about bad science, but bear with me and subscribe for more Seeker Plus. Make sure you check out the audio podcast of our show. You can find it on SoundCloud and iTunes and Spotify and Anchor and Megaphone and Speakerly. I actually made up the last one. That's not a real place. Today, we're going to do something special, and we're going to air a videotaped episode of bad science. Bad Science is normally just a podcast, and if you haven't heard of Bad Science before, Bad Science is a podcast that looks fondly at the science in your favorite movies and actually gets a scientist to come on and talk about it. They go, can we actually do that? And they bring a scientist and comedian together. Today we're going to kick into the science of Star Trek. We're going to talk about how fusion works in real life, how that relates to the movies, what the NIF is, the National Ignition Facility, and what it does, and a bunch of other stuff. So let's kick into it. Hi, everybody. It's Ethan Edinburgh, your host, and I'm here to talk about Star Trek with Trace Dominguez, the Seeker host extraordinaire, and we have a plasma physicist from Lawrence Livermore's National Ignition Facility, which I think they call NIF. She's the winner of the Presidential Early Career Award. It's Dr. Tammy Ma. Woo! Hi, everybody. I expected the audience to just like explode right yeah, there. Yeah, no, we need like a like an audience, like live studio audience. Okay, let's no, do this again. again, bring we're in good. some people. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, we're here to talk, talk about Star Trek, but I wanted to start talking about what you do, Tammy, because I, I only have a brief amount of information, but that information was very intriguing to me. So there's 192 laser beams at NIF. Is this correct? That's right. We are the world's largest and most energetic laser okay. here in your backyard. <laughs> uh, we, on a daily basis, almost uh, generate the hottest place in the solar system. We make miniature stars in the lab. Miniature stars in the lab. That's right, miniature stars. Okay, explain how that works, and also not to uh, correct you because I'm a fool and you're a genius, but this is Trace's backyard. I'm here as a guest, <laughs> and I appreciate right. you uh, hosting me. I'm also the hottest thing in the universe. Hey. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and a miniature star. <laughs> oh, it's like a weird. This backhand. is great. It's a weird backhand. You guys compliment. just come into you come into you're the blushing. studio. I am. <laughs> Come into the studio and just compliment me left and right. See if we can like keep him it. blushing the entire time. That's right, he's here. Um, so yeah, what does that mean? You're creating a miniature star. How does that work? So um, the reaction that we're after is actually a fusion reaction in the laboratory. And fusion is the same reaction that powers the sun. Um, what we try to do is combine hydrogen, um, get it up to high temperatures and densities. Um, and if we do it right, then it fuses and releases huge amounts of energy just like the sun. Wow, okay, so, and you do this by shooting a bunch, all these lasers into one small That's space, right. is that That's correct? That's right, our facility um, is uh, the size of three football fields, side by side, 10 stories tall, like you said, 192 lasers, so huge. And we're gonna take all of that laser energy and shine it all down on a tiny target that's about a centimeter in size. Okay. And then we compress the fuel that sits inside to make it a star, essentially. Can you, I, I'm, I'm a little confused as far as, so all these lasers are large and they, what they shoot is very small because why does the place have to be so big? That's right. Um, the place is so big because it has to house all of these optics where we can amplify up the laser. So we're not talking about a little laser pointer. Okay. Each laser in size is about 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters Okay. times 192. And the reason each one is so big is because we have to spread that laser energy out over the optics they're okay. traveling through. Otherwise, they would actually damage. Um, and then so we take all of those lasers and each one gets compressed back down to about the size of a human hair. Whoa. So just think about energy density. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so the like, what are you trying to achieve by doing this besides making something really, really hot and, uh, Smushing and, and cool some and hydrogen together? Yeah. So if we do um, our experiments just right, the point is to actually get more energy out than we put in with the laser. Okay. Because what we're trying to do in fusion reaction is take two um, small particles or two light elements, hydrogen, mm -hmm. and bring them together. And when they fuse, what they generate on the other side is a helium particle okay. um, and a lot of energy. And the way you make that energy is because that helium actually weighs a little bit less than your two hydrogens did at the beginning. And so what you're doing is taking that little bit of liberated mass and putting it into Einstein's equation, mm. E equals mc squared. I've heard of that. Have you? Yep. Um, where <laughs> m is that difference in mass, and okay. you're multiplying it by c squared, and c is the speed of light, a huge number. Right. You get a huge amount of energy out. 
Wow. So that's what fusion is. And that's what, if you do it just right, then you can actually get more energy out than we put in with the laser. And that's ignition for us. That's our, our So that is goal. like potentially the future of charging things. It is the, the future of energy, actually. The um, future of energy. The future of energy. Um, because it's, it's completely clean. It's carbon free, oh. unlike fossil fuels. So you can think of the implications for the environment. It's plentiful um, because hydrogen fuel, uh, where do we get hydrogen? Just water. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, um, the isotope that we're using, deuterium, is naturally occurring in seawater. Ooh, I have that and written so, down. Yes, yeah, so you <laughs> just you can actually scoop out seawater. Okay. Um, and then if you centrifuge it, um, you can get the deuterium out. Um, and then uh, there's no there's no high level nuclear waste that comes from fusion reactions, unlike fission. Wow. Um, and so it's it's a very um, exciting and attractive energy source if we can make it work. Can I ask what the actual energy kind of manifests as? Is it heat energy? Is it like some kind of high energy electromagnetic? Yeah. Like what, what um, do we got? It's actually going to be um, a neutron. Neutron? A very energetic neutron. Oh. And so... Like that just sounds dangerous to me, though. Like you're saying it's clean and, uh, you know, it's the future of energy. But when you say that it's a neutron. So, I mean, a neutron, I mean, it exists in every atom, right? It's just the neutral particle. OK. Um, and the energy is actually in how fast it travels. It's that energy that you would trap, okay. you would collect um, and use it to, say, heat up water to mm -hmm. run a turbine yeah. to generate the energy that you feed out to the grid. Guys, if you'll stick around, we got to take a quick break. I got is nowhere that, to go. Is that cool? Yeah. You have nowhere to go? You guys here. have nothing to do? Yeah. Nothing at all. Okay, fantastic. We'll be right back. When I was a kid, I read dozens of Star Trek books, mostly Star Trek Voyager because I was that kid. But I also read Harry Potter. And after I read through them a couple of times, I picked up the audiobooks. And I have to say, I have listened to Harry Potter more than I have read it because those audiobooks are amazing. They're read by Jim Dale. He does all the voices. And you can check them out for free with our new sponsor, Audible. You can try them with a 30-day free trial from Audible because you get a free book when you do that. Just go to audible.com slash seeker or text seeker to 500-500 to start your free trial. That's audible, A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash seeker or seeker to 500-500. You can do it with audiobooks. And if you're not into Harry Potter, if that's not your thing, there are so many other books to choose from. And please give me a recommendation. I'm always looking for new things to read or listen to. So just let me know what you pick, sign up with our code, and thank you so much for watching Seeker. Let's let's talk about Star Trek for a second and then hop back. So as a as a prequel here, not a prequel to the movie, but like as a preface to this conversation, I was never into Star Trek. I never watched the sh shows when I was little. I don't know if I don't, wasn't introduced to it by my parents. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, it's a you, big you gap. Messed up. Yeah, you messed big, up there. I, I have a few friends that really love it and do make fun of me for that, which is kind of funny to think about also, right? Like your friends making fun of you for not watching yeah, Star Trek. The nerds yeah, why weren't you inside yeah. watching television while we were all outside? <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't know. Something's wrong with me, I guess. Yeah. But anyways, I was I was excited to see this movie when it came out in 2009, the Chris Pine first of the new Star Treks, um, and thought it was great. I had a great time at this movie. I was telling Trace earlier, I went to see it three times in the theaters, which at that time, no movie passed, so I was paying for each one of these <laughs> a lot, uh, viewings, and I had a great time, um, and just wanted to know what you guys thought of the film. Have you seen it recently? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? I saw it actually three weeks ago because I was bored and it was a Saturday. So mm -hmm. I stayed inside and I watched Star Trek 2009. Okay. And, and I loved it because I've uh, watched it probably 40 times. Wow. Oh, maybe a lot 25. Of times. I don't know. I've watched oh, it wow. a lot of times. So maybe you'll be able, be able to answer some of my questions. I haven't seen it that many times and I had some real issues with it. But uh, Tammy? I have to admit, I have not seen the 2009 one. Oh, okay. <gasps> Great. Or if I did, I forgot. So. Yeah. Well, that's totally fine. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so you're going to be a little lost uh, by some of these questions. But okay. luckily, we, we, have, together. we have an expert here. Yeah. We work together. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a couple problems with it. Um, one, and I'll try and uh, and briefly explain some of this, uh, just in case other people haven't seen it. Also, so the the enemy in the movie is this guy uh, Nero, and so he <laughs> is destroying planets by drilling. He he drops this huge metal drill into a planet. He'll drill for a little while and then put in this like tiny glass. 
uh, like a canister. Some kind of fluid. Yeah, yeah, a fluid that has red matter in the middle. Whoa. And so red matter is like a big deal in this movie and it creates black holes. So we can get into that Somehow. as well. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, they definitely That's don't explain cool. that. It, it is, is cool. Get me some of that. They've yeah. got a lot of it too. There's like a whole ship filled <laughs> with a whole bunch of it. You'd be like, maybe like, Part that out. Can yeah, you spread it's it just around. This it's huge, huge ball, thing. and they just need a drop. And they're just like, "Hey, we got this much." It's very dangerous. Um, Makes no sense. This is totally spoiling stuff for you, by the way, and I'm really sorry about I feel that. Like That's at okay. this point, <laughs> she's got old uh, movie. She might not go see it. <laughs> yeah, right. She's in it now. Um, okay, so this was my problem, and and maybe you have a solution or a reason why. But why drill the hole? Why couldn't he you know just? What? That's an excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like it makes it more cinematic. I don't know why. You I know, mean, the like drill have, looks awesome. You have all that time because there's drilling, so the the bad guys are drilling. The good guys can have go time and do. to. If yeah. it was just like shooting it, they could shoot it from anywhere. You know, they can warp. Mm-hmm. So they just like warp in, drop off a black hole, leave. You've just messed up not just the planet, but that whole star system and that's its true. Star systems. And and I want to say much. also, by the way, you know. Not to offend you and not to offend any of our listeners or viewers at home. I'm not a Star Trek geek, obviously. I don't know. And I use geek as a, as a you know, complimentary it's a term. Good term. It's a good term. Uh, I just mean I don't know much about it. So if there are solutions that are out there and I don't know about them, <laughs> keep that in mind. I just watched the movie and I had some issues with it. Yeah. So that was one of them. And I will say, love the way the drill looked. It looked cool. It looked really Very, cool. Very like... Evil steampunk, yeah, kinda, which and I like awesome. how they like landed on it and were fighting on it and stuff. Like all of that is yeah. very cool, but then they kind of ruin it because there are scenes where they just throw this red matter at a planet or at an, a huge supernova or whatever, and then it still works the same. I mean, yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna engulf a planet with a with a black hole, why why does it need to be in the middle of the planet? That's a great question. I don't know. Okay, so so like, far I'm right. I mean, yeah, well, so, so <laughs> like to create a black hole, you need a, like a huge amount of mass, mm-hmm. and like that's why it's usually done with collapsing stars because there's so much mass that it collapses on itself and forms into this black hole. Okay, but this is done with such a tiny amount of mass. I mean, super small. They literally lift it at some point. Like lift it. They pull it out of the red matter. Oh, and right. They hold it in their hands. Yep. And then they put it into another thing. So like, it's got to have some got, magical. There must be yeah. Yeah. Star Trek is not well. Besides usually, the fact that it creates black holes. Yeah. Besides, yeah. like yeah. let's just assume <laughs> that, that, normal. that the matter part can somehow like actually right. do the weird out there physics that it's doing. Right. Like, I don't understand why. Like what? Ugh, it's dumb. It's yeah. really dumb. Okay. And so, it, Star Trek's not super magical. Like as a rule, they don't tend right. to go very magical. It's true, and they like, don't spend a lot of time explaining. This. But it's still like uh, things seem relatively uh, logical. That seems like a physics joke. Relatively, that's just yeah. That's I'm constantly yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. constantly making uh, subliminal jokes for later. Just so like, if anything I say sounds stupid, it. it's like oh, that's actually really smart. <laughs> it's just a joke He's for later. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got you. Um, okay, so here's <laughs> another one. I'm just gonna fire these off right here. So at, towards the end of the film, he starts attacking Earth. That's, mm-hmm. you know, of course, where uh, it all gets to. Sure. And he once again, he he comes near the planet. Near starts, San Francisco, actually. That's right. Right off of the uh, the old bay. I, by the way, and, uh, you know, Thank not you. to bring up terrible memories of San Francisco. I know this is your home and all. Uh, but a lot of these movies like attack San Francisco. Yeah, it's like, like the a, place to attack right now. It's kind the, of is. Godzilla it's attacked been, us. Yeah. It's always been. Yeah. 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 Okay. Has it really been? There's oh, so yeah. many films well, it's like where New York you see the It's got an iconic skyline. It's right? a nice skyline. Yeah. Cool bridges, people. lots of water around. <laughs> so you which feel makes bad it automatically because yeah, yeah, people yeah. are cool. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> I don't understand why they attack us all the time. Because we're that? cool. Yeah, they just don't they're like jealous. us. They're just jealous. Yeah, and it makes you feel worse as an audience member because if like they're attacking Iowa, there's kind of that like, oh whatever. But it's if they're attacking Iowa. San Francisco, they're like, no, yeah, all these cool people. Yeah, it's so pretty and iconic. Why do you got to blow that up? Yeah. So this is like way Although, in the future. Oh, before go. we get too far into it, no, please. part of the reason they attacked San Francisco in this case mm-hmm. is likely, be, again, plot device, because mm. Starfleet headquarters is San Francisco. That's true. So Starfleet it's like, if they attack somewhere else, then like Starfleet's going to have to go get in a motorcycle or something and drive down there. And yeah, they have everyone montage, gets in motorcycles. You know? Yeah, because Star, Starfleet loves motorcycles. <laughs> yeah, like, they wouldn't use, if you wouldn't use a space, spaceship. <laughs> yeah, if they're in space, they got spaceships. But if they're on Earth, motorcycles. Motorcycles <laughs> only. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so my, my thing here is that there's no defense going on at all. Like, they come and save the day from... 
outer space from like a space station or whatever but earth in the future has no way of knowing that there's no like a lasers huge on the moon or something spaceship is coming that is an enemy clearly an enemy spaceship it looks sure. terrifying and then the drill comes down and still nothing happens there's no i don't know it's just like one ship they're just like oh well we got this one we send that one yeah it was really far away oh, it's not here right now <laughs> like what a bummer have shields though no shields not around the planet there's yeah. just oh, nothing no. No, not, not the, not the ships, planet, yeah. around the ships. What? I mean, yeah. the, oh, enemy, probably. the enemy puts a shield around. That's true. Right. But I would have loved to see some turrets or just like, I don't know. Yeah. Some yeah. Launch, some little tower defense. You little know? tower just defense. Little, yeah. yeah, it makes me feel, uh, you know, a little safer knowing that in the future we have some sort of like, you Lasers can't, you can't mess with our yeah. planet. You yeah. Know? Before you go, this week, Secret Plus was sponsored by Rivers of Oil from Minnesota Public Radio. Rivers of Oil takes a look at the hidden world of oil pipelines that flow beneath our feet. It's really incredible, guys. It's really cool. The show explores why the oil pipelines are at the forefront of an epic tug of war between our dependence on oil and the risk that oil poses, the future of our world. And I know that we're talking about fusion and fission in this Star Trek-based episode, but right now we've still got oil. So, in true Seeker Plus fashion, we should all break it down so we understand it a bit better. And Rivers of Oil does that, and it helps us understand and the role that we play in this story, too. So check it out wherever you get your podcasts. A planetary shield? I kind of want one. Think about how good that would be, like how much that would help us. Can one of you out there get on that? That would be great. One of my favorite things about Star Trek is that it holds the promise of a future that is both technological and mostly peaceful with humanity working to better itself for a higher purpose. We seem to have figured out how to control climate change in this strange future, and San Francisco hasn't become an archipelago, which is great, so sea level rise must be under control, and society is pluralistic and diverse with aliens and humans living together all over the galaxy. Oh, it's awesome, right? It's an imagining of you know what we can be as a species, and I love that. What do you think about that? You can let us know down in the comments. You can let us know over on Twitter or Facebook. We've got a lot of science coming in the next episode next week, so stay tuned. Please subscribe for all the episodes in this series and the next series and the next series and the next series. And make sure that you find your favorite podcast delivery app and search for Secret Plus as well. We'll see you next time. <laughs>